Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jillian Allison. I'm the director of the Center for Colorado Women's History. And I'm joining you from 1310 Bannock Street next to the Denver Art Museum. Today, we are going to be um, using the Q&A function and the chat and answering questions at the end. So um, please go ahead and take a moment to find those. And if you um, need assistance with Zoom or anything else, um, my colleague Jay is here and will be um, available for assistance. You can go ahead and put a question in the chat directed towards Jay or our speaker, um, and Jay can help during the program. Um, and we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. I am so thankful for all of you for joining us today and um, our speaker is a wonderful author uh, who has written a fascinating book um, that I am so pleased that we have the opportunity to learn more about. Um, Today we have Jane Little Botkin, author of The Girl Who Dared to Defy, Jane Street and the Rebel Maids of Denver. In her book, uh, Jane Little Botkin elves family, American families, personal narratives with compelling stories of labor radicals, miners, lawmen, and outlaws in rich settings that transition into the New West. She became intrigued with Jane Street after learning that as a teenager, her grandmother, worked as a domestic in a Colorado mansion at the same time as the events in The Girl Who Dared to Defy Jane Street and The Rebel Maids of Denver took place. Thank you for being here to share your presentation, Jane Street, Activist or Revolutionist? I'm looking for my screen. Jillian, I'm seeing your screen still. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Are you there? Okay. Jillian? Yes. There you are. Okay. Uh, I cannot see my screen, but I guess it does not matter if I'm seeing yours. So your screen is the one that's being shared. I stopped sharing my screen and we're not seeing your... Okay. I, I, I'm seeing my face up there, so I'll just start going. If everybody's looking, can seeing me there. Well, that... Okay. Okay. That's my first slide. Give me just a second here. Sure, and go ahead I and want to go take your time. Yeah, I am because that is all just stopped. Everything just went back the way it was. And people, if you'll be just a moment, we are back to where we shouldn't be. So I don't want my screen, my screen shared and I cannot unscreen. There we go. Let me just go back. Jillian, if we'll get mine not shared, that would be great. Uh, okay. So I'm looking at you and I'll share the screen in just a moment then. Um, I want to thank Jillian, first of all, and the Center for Colorado Women's History. Um, this is wonderful. I'm so excited to speak to you because I actually did a lot of my research uh, at the Stephen H. Hart Library in History Colorado, which is associated obviously with the, the Center for Colorado Women's History. And this kind of brings everything around circle for me, everything back home. Um, the topic that I chose was Jane Street activist or was she a revolutionist? Um, and I'm, I, when I get finished with this, I'm going to see what you think. Uh, you may be a little bit surprised. There we go. That's what I needed to see. All right, first of all, yes, Jillian just talked about the connection that I had with Jane Street. The reason I started writing this book was when I was doing my research for my first book, which was Frank Little and the IWW, I came across where Frank Little had actually met with Jane Street and helped her organize a union. 
And Frank Little was my uncle who was murdered in Butte, Montana for free speech, basically his radical beliefs, but they didn't like what he had to say. And so he was murdered um, at a time when he had just helped Jane Street. And I was fascinated with that. And when I started looking into information on Jane Street, I saw, well, she had been a housemaid in Denver and she had organized the housemaid rebellion of Denver. And I wanted to look into that more. Coincidentally, my grandmother, who was born in Denver, was the daughter of a, um, a Scandinavian immigrant, a Danish immigrant, who had basically, basically gone from mining camp to mining camp. Uh, some of the family believe she just may have been a prostitute. He went to the various mining camps and she ended up marrying a miner. And he was killed on the Alaska, on the Klondike trail before my grandmother was born. She never even knew her, who her grandfather was. And then my great grandmother married a mining superintendent, a Frenchman in Louisville, Colorado. And that's where my grandmother moved. But when she was 13, my great grandmother died of pneumonia and the step grandfather or stepfather, my step great, great grandfather shot himself accidentally pulling a rifle out of the back of a wagon uh, somewhere between Fort Collins and actually a hill that's called Dead Man's Hill in Colorado, not named after him. It was just a coincidence and he died. And some people came from Iowa to get my grandmother. She was an only child. My great grandmother had no other children and um, she was just whisked away. And what I found was when she was 16, she was married to a 32 year old Swedish immigrant. It was an arranged marriage and she fled. She went back to what she knew, which was near Louisville and she went to work and we're gonna try this right here. We're gonna see if this is gonna work. I'm now gonna to try to get into this, this PowerPoint the way I should. Um, and I'm gonna share this and we're gonna get started. And now I get to do the present, we'll get going here. So she was, she went to work in this mansion. Um, it is in Boulder, Colorado. It is over 7,300 square feet. Uh, you can imagine it had quite a few servants to actually run this mansion. I had postcards that she had mailed from here and I, and she was here in 1916, which is the exact time that Jane Street was organizing. And I'm always looking for that little family connection. So again, I, that's what I did. I, I decided I'm going to find this story. So um, I started researching. And one of the things I found out was she was born in 1887 in Indiana. She moved to Arkansas. Uh, her family was broken. All of her siblings had died. I mean, there'd been a bunch of children except for one sister. And it's this older sister who had this effect on her, which in the end helped Jane do something so remarkable. And that is to organize a domestic workers union when nobody was even thinking about doing such a thing. This girl from Indiana that moves to Arkansas and then ends up in Colorado, it seems serendipity, but there was a purpose for that as well. And so I'm going to show you um, her sister because she plays, a, she plays a part in this as well. And I'm gonna try to get this squeezed over here. So this is Grace Tuttle and she's gonna open the book in chapter one. And if you look at her, she's just a little bit risque. Uh, you, she's got her shoulders there. She, oh, and if you look at the, the lower left-hand corner, you get this woe be gone uh, picture of her. She's acting, she's an actress. And if you look at the middle picture, what you don't know is she's a cooch dancer. She was actually doing burlesque. And she's kind of, I mean, there were, the way the girls were raised, there was obviously, there was a lack of parenting going on. Grace ran off again, like to Coney Island, and that's where she's doing all this. And Jane becomes a stenographer. She wasn't even a maid. She graduated from high school, becomes a stenographer, and she moves to um, Arkansas. This is Jane Street, and I'm tickled to show all these pictures, because, photographs, because when you write a, uh, any kind of a book, um, <laughs> each photo costs money. And it's, you're only given so many photos for the production. And in this case, I think I was given either 25 to 30, I'd probably 25. And it was very, very hard for me to decide what to show. But you see the evolution of this little girl. And by the time you see her in this photo with the long, long hair on the far right, um, you see what Jane looked like about the time she decided to go to California. 
Uh, the center picture where she's sitting in the dress, not the one with the hat on, but the one in the group, that's a high school graduation picture. And the one in the plaid dress, she's actually pregnant and she's quite happy. But that was a little bit of a, um, a, a story too. It's actually a terrible story. So I'm gonna leave it right here just for a moment. So, so you look at the photo and I'm going to give you a little bit of context about her background. So she moves to Arkansas. Her father died in 1905. Her mother is very despondent, not even paying attention to the girls. And this man who was 32 years old just starts uh, moving in, taking care of Jane, taking her here and there, corresponding with her. And it was much like what a pedophile would do. He was grooming her. And so he continued to groom her while her mother wasn't paying any attention. And her father is now gone. And he tells her he loves her. He gets her pregnant. So she was pregnant out of wedlock. And the bad thing is, is this guy was already married and his wife was having a baby too. And Jane does not know that. In fact, he goes by a bunch of uh, aliases. And this becomes, his name is Herbert Bumpus, alias Jack Street. And he will become a major player in the book. And in fact, in 1916, um, I will not be going into this. That's a whole nother, there's so many areas that this book branches out. But he causes quite an uproar in Denver and it makes national news all during the summer because of a crime. He was a con man. And so she finds out, she, she gets pregnant, she loses the baby. Remarkably, she gets pregnant again and he marries her. And then she finds out the truth about him and she follows her sister, Grace, to California. And California is vaudeville and Grace is going to be, she's left cooch dancing behind and she is going to be a vaudeville uh, dancer or vaudeville actor or actress. She was musical, classically musically trained. She was very talented. She was very, very good. And so Jane goes to California. And while they're in California, she finds, she finds work as a stenographer in a Sacramento hotel, never a maid, didn't have any notion of what domestics did. She was not in a union. So what happened? Whenever you're looking um, at history, you can typically tell a country's economic health is how it affects people's ideologies. And at this time period in America, we had tremendous immigration and the people who were coming into the country were feeding the industrial revolution. They were feeding the factories, they were feeding the mining camps, they were feeding the logging uh, camps. Um, they were doing, oh, a tremendous amount of work. They were thrilled to be here but they were, um, if you remember your history from school, it was the robber barons who were um, in charge and the robber barons, well, we know some of the famous ones. If you take a look here, you can look at the Copper Trust, you can look at Standard Oil and you know that's J.D. Rockefeller Jr. And actually he and Carnegie uh, were both involved with the Iron Trust, the Sugar Trust, well, that's from San Francisco. That was uh, Otis, Otis Gray. Uh, steel beam trust. <laughs> They're making fun here. We've got a nail trust, but there was even a cattleman's trust, uh, cattle, cattleman barons. And these particular families and individuals controlled most of the wealth in the country. They owned the, co the companies that were producing all the money at the time. And the United States was just rolling. It was just doing fantastic. But at the same time, it was doing it on the backs of these workers. Like I said, many of them immigrants or they were just disenfranchised Americans. And if you look at the health of the country at the time, there are two reasons, two things that happened that kind of thrust Jane into where she was going with domestic organizing. One was there was a panic in 1893. Um, and at that, the time of that panic, we had had gone from gold to silver. Uh, people in Colorado will really know this. There was the Sherman Silver Purchase Act where the mining, miners in um, Silver City, Blackhawk, all of that area that you're familiar with in Colorado, they were mining silver. They'd gone from gold to silver because that's what the standard was going to be. And there was just an overproduction of silver. And then all of a sudden we didn't have enough gold in our reserves and there was a panic. At the same time, this was happening, a populist party formed. They were disenfranchised Democrats and they were mainly farmers. 
and they were upset over what was happening with their lands as well. Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma, actually became almost 100% red, and I'm not talking about red Republican, they were red socialist uh, because the populists were leaning that way. And then in 1907, there was another panic. They call it like the banker's panic. And again, this really impacted Capitol Hill uh, in particular, because these were your wealthy people losing their money. Um, it, and of course, this does filter down to the workers. And then not so, so not surprisingly, people that had been part of the progressive part of the Democratic Party started becoming socialists. So just like in all of our history, you see things, um, the reason we learn history is because it happens again and again. And I'm gonna use Eugene Debs as an example. We all studied Eugene Debs. You may or may not remember him in your US history class when you were in high school. He was first a Democrat. And then after the Pullman strike, which was a very important railroad strike that happened at this time period, he became a founding member of the Socialist Party of America. And then he became a founding member of the Industrial Workers of the World. And I'm gonna tell you about them in just a moment. And then they were very radical. And then the industrial workers of the world decided they didn't like the, the socialist party because they, wouldn't you know, they were lobbyists and they were into politics and the IWW was not. And Debs didn't like them because they were too radical. So this is kind of the background. And when you go back, I'm gonna stop that share right there because I'm coming to that. When you go back and you look amidst all of this for the women and you have the, your, your, all the women's suffrage, the activists and Colorado in particular, one thing I did discover is how proud Colorado is of its women and of its suffragists. And I had a lot of time going through those files at the Stephen H. Hart Library. I went into those files looking for Jane Street. And of course there, there wasn't anything. But by then I'd already found out the names of a lot of these women, the movers and the shakers that lived on Capitol Hill. And I found voluminous files on Louise Sneed Hill, who is a primary player in this book. And you know, she's the one who founded the Sacred 36 and wanted to ally with Jane because she wanted to poke at the matrons on Capitol Hill. And that's another entirely fun story with Louise Sneed Hill. I got to hold Susan B. Anthony's letters in my hands and that was just, it was thrilling. But I went into those club meetings and I looked at these individual women's files and went into all the different organizations. And um, they were, they were, they had purpose. Uh, some of them were just, you know, they were doing it out of leisure time. The sad thing is what Jane found out was that a lot of the women who were working, they were activists and working for the rights of, of women um, and other issues that were going on. They weren't paying attention to the very people who were working in their homes and living in their homes. So you, within that panorama, this is when Jane is going to arrive. Now I want to show you that particular slide. Okay, here we go. So if you're as old as I am, then you remember this movie called Reds. Uh, you may have been born in 1981 when this movie came out. It actually won Best picture that year. And Warren Beatty, who is the gentleman there on the right with the tass tasseled hair, he's the one who actually directed this movie. It, it's a true story about a guy named John Reed, who was a journalist in 1917, 1916. He actually was infatuated with the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. But the reason I want to show you this <clears throat> is because, you, first of all, you see it's entitled Reds, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution was happening, uh, began in 1917, but the IWW was formed in 1905, but they were called Reds, but they were called Reds that was later. It was actually, uh, John Reed was infatuated again with the Russian Revolution. He ended up dying there because of his idealism. They're all young. And if you look at them, um, you have Jack Nicholson there on the left, who's playing one of the characters, very, very young. You've got Diane Keaton. The IWW was formed because in 1905, because of the labor unrest and the way people were treated, particularly in the West, and particularly because of the Colorado labor wars in 1903 and 1904. Um, they, uh, 
the Western Federation of Miners, who some call the Western Federation of Murderers, really were not all thugs. I mean, there were there was some killing on both sides, but these were some pretty bad times for mine owners and miners both. And because of what happened in Colorado in 1903 and 1904, uh, the IWW was formed in 1905. And the people who founded it, uh, Vincent St. John, who was the first secretary treasurer, that it means he was the one controlling a lot of things. They didn't have bosses in the IWW, there were no presidents, but he was only 29 at the founding. Um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who is a prime player in the book, in 1917, she was 27. So she was just a child when this happened. Uh, people that were involved with Jane were all in their 30s, except for one person. They were in their 30s. And even Frank Little, my uncle, who actually helped Jane, he was 38 at the time of Jane Street's revolution, but he'd been 26 when the IWW formed. He was not one of the founding members. I had a, uh, a member of the IWW when I went to the Centennial in Butte, Montana back in 2017. There were some kids there, and I say kids, they were college kids or just out of college, and they were members of a group. And he pointed to them and he said, I want you to realize that this is what the IWW was. It was started by kids just like them. And they had all this idealism. So when we talk about Jane, we realize that she has, she gets this idealism. And the idealism, well, let me just, let me just share the pro, some of the opening statements to the preamble of the constitution of the IWW, this radical organization. And I'll explain a couple of things that really appeal to the people at the time because of the context I just told you. It says the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace as long as hunger and want are found among millions of the working people and the few who make up the employing class and have all the good things in life. Between these two classes, a struggle must go on until the workers of the world organize as a class take possession of the means of production, abolish the wage system and live in harmony on the earth. So obviously that is going to mean revolution, is it not? As far as what's, what the way our country was founded and with capitalism, it's gonna mean that. So there is going to be, there are, are some other catalysts that are going to come. These people start, not just the IWW, but you have all these other unions that have formed. Uh, and again, they're, they're moving toward what we call syndicalism in general. These are the union strikes against their perceived injustices on workers, uh, gender bias, gender discrimination. The IWW was very inclusive. They included whether you were a trade or you weren't a trade, whereas the AFL, they, they were trades. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman, it didn't matter what your skin color was, they were open to everyone. And that, that attracted a lot of people at this time period. And then there was Ludlow. So I'm going to read a passage, it's a very brief passage from my book. It is actually in the opening, the opening part of the book, it's the, uh, in the introduction. Um, Ludlow, for those who are not from California who are watching today, it's not far from Trinidad. If you're going from where I am down here in Texas and I'm driving up to Denver, I'm gonna be on I-25, go over the Raton Pass. And it's not gonna be too long before I'm going to see a sign on the left that says Walsenburg. And there's also a sign I think that says the sign of the Ludlow Massacre. And this massacre was a watershed in event in labor history. And it had a profound, profound effect on Jane Street. While I do that, whoops, we just went, that was Jane Street in 1950. I was telling you how young everybody looked. That's what she looked like. So here we go. All right, this is, you, you see a tent on your left and that is a tent in Ludlow. And you see all these children. There were about 1200, 1200 plus people at Ludlow. This was a mining camp well, actually mining camp. They had been miners. They were working for a uh, corporation partially owned or he controlled it, J.D. Rockefeller Jr. Um, 
and they were coal miners. They had gone on strike for more money, better working conditions. He had denied them. Not only had they been denied, but he was, uh, the, they, he tossed them out of their, their company housing. I mean, if they were gonna be on strike then they could not live in his housing. So they set up all these tents. Again, I said there were a little bit over 1200 people between 200 and 300 were children and they were primarily immigrants, uh, Spaniards, Greeks, Italians, um, and they, they were so proud to be Americans. They had American flags at the top of their tents and they were trying to hold out. And so let me read this and then we'll talk just for a second and how this affects Jane Street. So this is just in the very opening of the prologue of my book and I'll let you look at this picture, this photograph while I read this to you. It says, of course, I'm going to begin with a quote from Mother Jones. Mary Harris Jones actually went to Trinidad. She was there trying to fight for the people, the miners and their families in Ludlow, and she was arrested and thrown in jail. She said, God Almighty made women and the Rockefeller gang of thieves made the ladies. So here we go. Marcelina Pedragoni, her thin skirt partly ablaze in the early morning light, recalled running hard, sprinting northward toward a fence and then crawling into a smoky arroyo where she could lay flat in the rocky dirt, trying to become invisible from the bullets ripping around, nipping around her legs and feet like a mad dog. She saw some women dodging flames to desperately help their children reach a well and then scramble inside after them while others sought safety in a pump house its walls being chewed by gunfire. Amid their shrieks and wails, Marcelina allowed a brief hesitation to worry about her own children she had left behind. Cloriva and Rogerio, just four months and six years old. They had been staying with the Valdez and Costa children near tent number 58, one of about 150 makeshift homes for Colorado's Southern Coalfield miners and their families when someone shrieked, dynamite, dynamite. As militia soldiers exploded several bomb bombs to signal their assault on the striking miners, Mrs. Costa would have rounded up the youngsters and scuttled them for safety into the deep dirt cellar underneath the tent's wooden floorboards. Hadn't Mother Jones, who had come to Trinidad in late 1914 and early 19, I'm sorry, early 1913 and early, did it again, late 1913 and early 1914 urged families to prepare for such a fight? Even then, Jones had been arrested for challenging mine operators and the Colorado National Guard commanded by Adjutant General John Chase. In fact, Ludlow Colony had been fearing violence for seven months now after witnessing a Gatling gun discharge, 147 bullets into a coal miner's tent whose occupant survived by lying prone during the attack. Ludlow's colony of tents housed over a thousand people including 271 children. Most tents covered shallow pits, some now filled with weeping women and babies, but the Costa pit was deeply dug, its black maw waiting to swallow three women and 11 children and keep them safe from the bullet sprays. Knowing this, Marcelina could alternately crawl and run until she too could escape the barrage of bullets screaming from the Gatling gun atop Water Tank Hill. She had no way to know that once the shooting stopped at sundown, Uniformed men would begin torching the canvas tents not already aflame, many flying American flags above them. She would not have seen the murder of their Greek leader, Louis Tikas, who carrying a white flag was struck in the head with a rifle butt and then brutally shot. The next day, as survivors struggled into Trinidad, Marcelina asked with parched lips if anyone had news of her children. Not until a dead wagon arrived, loaded with 14 bodies, did she find Cloriva and Rogerio, smothered, burned, and swollen, along with others who asphyxiated in the Costa death pit. Cartolima Costa's dead pregnant body remarkably gave birth to a stillborn baby, doctors calling it the strangest childbirth ever given to a woman. So this was an event that um, it tore up people all over the country. All the newspapers picked it up. J.D. Rockefeller Jr.'s companies had been involved in other kind of similar events where minors or, in, or innocent people had been killed before. 
but this was so different because of the children. 11 of the people who died were children. They were all, all the children actually that were under, in, underneath that tent perished. And he couldn't escape this because it was in the newspapers. It was wired all over the country. He had just been on Capitol Hill testifying about how wonderful he was. And then this had happened. And so he made excuses, but this was kind of his undoing as far as uh, any respect for him. It actually made big changes. At the time this happened, which was in 1914, uh, Jane Street was working as a stenographer. And there was some labor unrest in the hotel where she was working with hotel workers. They were getting, there was getting ready to be a big exposition uh, was going to occur. And because of that exhibition, uh, hotel workers were talking about unionizing. It had already started on the East Coast with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, she was famously known as the girl orator. She, I'm sorry, my, my, oh, I just lost you. Oh my goodness. I just lost you, hang on. There we go. Um, people are dinging me on my computer, which they need to stop. Um, she, um, she became a, a leader in the country because she was young and she was so good at speaking and she had started speaking all across the country. And Jane is reading about her and she's seeing her stories too and this is going to tie together. So how does Jane arrive in Colorado? She starts, first of all, she does become a little activist while she's in Colorado. She um, still is uh, mourning for not having her husband uh, she, or losing her husband. She actually starts writing some newspaper articles about a prohibition that was being proposed in California. And of course they already had wine industry was starting and she doesn't like it that, that uh, they're going to make, keep it wet she wants it dry because she thinks that uh, husbands are not good husbands if they can drink. So you kind of get an idea on her. And so she writes that she says that when a man gets drunk in a saloon or a place of business, I'm gonna read this to you. The disgrace of her men folks is her disgrace. His sorrow is her sorrow. His fine is her fine. His poverty is her poverty and the poverty of her children. If you're a man, you will stand up for her wives and mothers, no matter what your business association or political affiliations or your appetite may dictate, you'll stand up for her because you are a man. Now, this is activism. And as you can see, she still has faith that men are good and that they can take care. But she starts walking to and from work and these IWW soapboxers are on the street corners and they're talking. And Probably she started becoming indoctrinated this way. Ludlow had happened. The, the, this army of unemployed men had come into Sacramento to find work because of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. They needed all kinds of workers, but they weren't getting hired. And in fact, the city uh, moved in with soldiers and, and police and other uh, civil authorities, and they host them down with the fire truck. They drove them out and told them to go back where they came from. And so there's starting to be a little bit of civil arrest. They've asked for these people to come and then they don't have the jobs for them. And of course, this is, um, it's less than 10 years. I mean, it's maybe just a five or six years after the last panics. So it's not like everything is really going well anyway. And here comes Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She's traveling across the United States and she's speaking. And She's going to speak in Oakland and probably Jane went to hear her in Oakland, although that topic was not about the Ludlow massacre. Instead, she does do another article and, and story on Ludlow. And when she does, um, and I'm hoping that I have this right here. Um, yeah, I do. And so when she does, Jane sees this particular article and the quote I'm going to show you, and I did lose my, my uh, my, my PowerPoint, excuse me very much. I'm going to go right back to it. Let me go back to that slide. I knew that happened just then when I, I was being dinged on my, let me go back here. We'll catch that very quickly for you. And we, of course, there's the heartbreaking children. And there is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in 1915. She said, the queen in the parlor has no interest in common with the maid in the kitchen. What had happened was, 
and it had hit the newspapers, is that the women, the good women on Capitol Hill, their husbands had been part of the National Guard unit or some of the units that had been assigned down there by Ludlow. Now, many of those men went back to Denver and they were filled with basically thugs who took part in this horrible massacre. But even still, many of these women, Capitol Hill's women, made some very nasty comments about the deaths, basically that they were just cattle. They were just miners' wives. They, we didn't need them anyway. It was a good thing, that sort of thing. And that also did not look very good. The commander, Chase, was actually the ophthalmologist, one of the ophthalm big ophthalmologists on Capitol Hill, um, very prominent doctor, and he was the commanding adjutant general. So that particular quote ties Ludlow to Capitol Hill. And what we know next is, is that Jane decides to go to Denver. Grace didn't find her vaudeville job. And Grace says, you know, I can open up a music school in Denver and Jane already has these other ideas. And the fact of the matter is she's decided she's going to organize these maids. She has no union training. She had joined the IWW, but no one had ever done anything like that. And this was a small group and these guys weren't interested in what these women did anyway. So she goes to Denver, her feet hit the pavement right when she gets there because she has to learn what a maid does. She gets a job as a maid. So the old histories that say that Jane Street and the, the small thing that they ever say is that she was a housemaid who organized a rebellion. I guess that's sort of true because she was a maid for three months. She could have gone to work as a stenographer, but she didn't. She went to work as a maid. One of the differences between the two sisters is that Jane was highly organized. She had this analytical head. She was all about, uh, she was one of, one of those people, if you have friends who make lists, she was a list, make, list maker, constantly making lists and notes on what she needed to do. Whereas her sister was the polar opposite, just very creative, um, would have been a great person to know here during the 1960s, she would have been a flower child. That's just the way she was. They're totally different. But Jane decides that she's going to do that and Grace is going to run this music school. And so um, she works as a maid and then she does something really, really remarkable in Denver. Now, again, you look at activists versus revolutionists. This is this is activism. What she wasn't doing was anything that necessarily um, fit 100 percent with the IWW mantras. I mean, she was working to organize a local within the IWW but it very quickly became a little bit different. And no one had done it. So again, she has to figure her own way on how to organize, unlike women who worked in uh, garment industries or cannery industries that have unionized to some degree, a lot of, a, a big de degree, excuse me. So the first thing she did is she starts running an ad in Denver newspapers and she's running an ad for, let's just say a, um, a nanny or a cook. And she gives a, a, an address that you can, if you were interested in that sort of job, you can contact her. And of course, these maids think that she is actually an employer, a mistress. Once Jane is contacted, she has already looked in the Denver newspapers to see who is searching for such a position to be filled in that house. So she matches, let's say the maid, to a mistress. She sends them. And in effect, she's acting as the employment, the employment agency. In doing so, I mean, it was a brilliant plan. In doing so, she's meeting each one of these domestics as they come. She sends them to their job. She tells them if it doesn't work out, you come back. She's compiling lists and information. And when she has enough names, she puts out a notice that she's going to have what were called experience meetings. Now you have to understand domestics lived isolated from everybody else. They might have a room in the basement. They might have a room up in the attic. They, not all of them had, in fact, the majority of them did not have great experiences. There are instances where they talk about they were fed the scraps off of their family's plates. They were not allowed to have meat. They were not allowed to have um, fresh eggs. And I actually have a, a, a true story in the book about that, about being booted out because you served the mistress the old egg and you ate the fresh. Um, they were not allowed to have visitors. 
when they had free time, which was rare, they were expected to go to their rooms where they could sew or read, but they, they could not have company. Certainly not any men friends could come. And they had all hours to work. There was no number of hours and they were expected to serve dinner on Sundays. I mean, they didn't even get a day off. So they don't have much opportunity to talk with other maids unless they happen to meet them at the, the grocer or someplace that they're going to shop for something for the family. So when Jane has these experience meetings, she allows them to get up and tell their tales. And these women are just, um, they think that this is just, wow, you know, I, this is the same thing that's happened to me and I worked for her. And there, were, there was a reporter who was there who had sneaked in and she was uh, listening to all these stories and she did publish the first story about these experience meetings and she knew better than to give the Capitol Hill ladies their full name. So it would be like Mrs. T or Mrs. S. And so um, she, uh, it, the experience meetings become a hit and then Jane starts having more meetings. But when she starts having more meetings, when they walk in the door, they get a note card and she said, I need to have some information from you. I'd like to know who you're working for. I want to know how big that house is. And does your mistress have children? If so, how many? Uh, what are your hours? What are your duties? Um, do you get free time? What is your mistress's husband's occupation? Because it had gotten to where some of these madams, they would literally fire a girl rather than pay her because they could hire someone else. And if they, they fired a girl who didn't have any, didn't get her pay, then Jane would send a, an attorney that she had gotten to show up on the husband's business doorstep. And it didn't look so good. And a lot of them, of course, were members of the Chamber of Commerce. So she basically is creating this um, blacklist, which is what it was called. And the Denver mistresses, particularly on Capitol Hill, get very, very upset. Um, they're not liking this at all. And in fact, Jane was so effective with this, with this list, that a girl could come in and look for a job. You'd pull up the card with this woman's name on it, and you find out how rotten of an employer she was. And she, the girl would say, no way, I'm not going to work there. And so there were now women who could not get domestics to work for them. The women were working with the real employment agencies. Um, the IWW calls them sharks and they literally were. The way this worked was the same way as in mining camps and lumber camps. If someone needed work, you'd go to an employment agency, you paid a fee, usually a dollar, for them to match you to a job. Uh, if you're working uh, in a lumber camp, for example, you'd also have to pay a fee for a hospital fee that they would have throw in too. And then what would happen would be is oftentimes the employer would only keep that maid, that domestic or lumber worker or whatever, so long they fire them. And then the girl would have to go back or the guy would have to go back and start all over again paying the dollar. And oftentimes that money was split between the manager of say the lumber company and the employment agency. It was a racket. And so Jane is taking business away now from the employment agencies too. So the story about Jane Street is so full of uh, angst. Um, there is so much betrayal and attacks on her because she was a woman. And of course she's making enemies right off the bat with the women of Capitol Hill and the employment agencies. Um, so one of the things I found out is that prostitution, prostitutes were just a step, I mean, I'm sorry, maids were just a step away from prostitution. There was a labor study done in 1914. It was an extensive one and they came out, the, the federal government did it. And they came out and found that domestic workers that was actually the most dangerous profession in America were the domestic workers. They could be sexually abused in the homes where they were working. Um, they were thrown out of work so easily. And what many, many of these girls could make more money as a prostitute, even in a crib, because they were not with their own crib and not working for a, some madam in Denver. And Denver definitely had its prostitution, its district, its red light district. So at this first meeting where these girls show up, uh, I'm going to read just this to you, this one little paragraph. It said, there stood fiery little Jane Street. And by the way, that's what the newspaper called her. As described by the disguised post reporter in attendance who gave her own experiences working in the kitchen of one Denver mistress, Mary, who had shown up, and that's, she's the woman that um, has the story about the egg. And the other women viewed Jane with curiosity. The diminutive woman standing in front of them was energetic feisty, fearless, not tired, downtrodden, and submissive. How could she talk rebellion? 
it was unnatural for servants to question their masters and mistresses. In fact, the entire meeting seemed surreal, even illegal, though no laws had been broken. This young woman was awakening them to the realization that they could voice complaints about work, share commiserations, and unite with purpose. And they could not peel their eyes away from Jane Street. So this is how this began. And um, you can see she was able to get, uh, she got over a thousand records. She had over 300 maids at the time um, that, that joined the union. An interesting um, person in this is Louise Sneed Hill. Louise, who follows the newspapers constantly about anything that's written about her, naturally, was good friends with Fr Fred Bonfils, who was the owner of uh, the Denver Post. And um, there was a letter that was written that was in support of Jane that shows up at the next meeting. And it looks like probably Louise is the one who sent the letter because it came through the reporter and the Denver Post had the copy of the letter. Uh, at the time, even Louise had an article done about herself. She's posing in all of her travel gear and she's showing the different fashions, you know, of, of traveling. And she talks about, they talk about how wonderful her servants are and how happily employed they are. And in fact, one of her maids, her was Cora Cowan. And I got to talk to that family and find a lot out about Cora. Cora probably was at this meeting in Louise Center. And so Louise starts poking these matrons and mistresses like, I don't have any trouble. I'm the perfect mi mistress. You know, my, my people have been with me for like 25 years. I treat them right. You know, and so um, this is this is the way this kind of goes, and you see a lot of uh, conflict between the the ladies who think Louise is kind of naughty anyway. Um, there are some great characters in this. I say characters; these are real people. Harriet Campbell was wonderful. Uh, she was an activist and a leader in Denver society, and there are a number of names there of what they did. And I actually get into a meeting where they they had a meeting. They formed a group called the Housewives Assembly to counter Jane, and they have a meeting. And again, the reporter writes down everything they have to say, and it doesn't necessarily look so good on some of these women. And of course, Louise was not invited to it. She was not a member of the Housewives Society, and I'm sure she was grinning when she was reading the article the next morning in her newspaper. So um, one of the things they try to do is they... Uh, they decide, and again, this was Harriet Campbell, she decides that maybe, you know, the YWCA needs to be involved. And um, the YWCA nationally was actually looking at the domestic problem. They called it the servant problem. I mean, it wasn't just a Denver problem, it was a national problem. And a lady comes, uh, um, a leader named Harriet, and I'm gonna mispronounce the last name. I'm probably, it's probably pronounced Rayleff. It's R-O-E-L-E-F-S. German, I live here near German, Texas. If you pronounce that second vowel, it could have been relatives. But anyway, she comes to visit to tell the ladies to bring their maids and come to this meeting and tell them how we can fix this problem without it being a union. And Jane is invited. Of course, Jane doesn't go. Uh, and again, they invite a different reporter from a different from the Rocky Mountain News because they think they're going to get a fairer story and they don't. And um, Jane doesn't go because what they're preaching is home economics. And this is how home economics actually got in our classrooms was as a result of all of this, the YWCA was push pushing an industrial economics class and a home economics class. The difference between working women in, that are working as domestics and women who are housewives. And that's how we got home economics classes. And Jane doesn't want to have anything to do with which is considered kind of scientific. And that's what they considered that then. So that was another try. At the same time, all this is going on. She is fighting the housewives with the exception of Louise Sneed Hill. She's fighting the employment agencies. And then she starts fighting the IWW men herself. And this is where things start getting bad. Um, there is a thing called, we called it viral syndicalism. I did not coin that. That was coined by someone else. And what was going on was the men, the IWW men who had formed a local in Denver, um, they were 
not happy with Jane being there. They resented her. Jane had kind of sucked up all the air in uh, IWW newspapers and even in the Denver newspapers for that matter. Uh, if Jane was speaking on a street corner, well, it was a street corner that just happened to belong to one of these IWW men. And this was a holdover from the Western Federation of Miners Day. The WFM believed that women, good union women, supported their men. They were good wives at home, but the men were the one who were working. And it's just kind of a holdover attitude. And so they started um, spreading rumors that Jane's clubhouse, which she had set up like Hull House and Jane Adams, where she could give the girls a chance to come in and, and talk and plan and have their meetings. She provided childcare for them, a place for them to stay if they were thrown out of a job. She even had teachers coming in that were freely teaching the girls, the free legal care I talked about. Um, there's no room for the men there and they don't like it. And because there were, there were some, the employment agency sent white slavers to one, of, one or two of the meetings that Jane was doing to try to coerce girls to go work for brothels these men spread rumors that Jane is now running a house of ill repute, which is very far from the truth. And it just gets worse. And there's a whole story on that. So she's not trusting men too much. So enters a fellow named Charles Devlin. And I'm going to show you, we're going to switch here again. I'm going to show you his photo. And hopefully that's going to be the one that's going to come right up next. Oh, there's Jane as an organizer. Oh, look how different she looks. She doesn't look like that gorgeous brunette we saw earlier. And of course she says, yours for the DWIW. And this was just a couple of years later. They were called the Dust Domestic Workers Industrial Union, otherwise known as the Housemaids Union. Here's Charles Devlin. Charles Devlin <laughs> fell in love with Jane. He truly loved her. And if we want to look at for an ev uh, any evidence of Jane becoming a revolutionary when she was a revolutionist, when we know she was definitely an activist, we have to look at the men in her life. And Charles Devlin is one. He was a one-legged ex-circus performer and a showman. He was a dreamer of a perfect utopia. And he fell in love with her. I want you to listen to his language. He says, when I went into the office, I met what to me was the most wonderful little lady I had ever seen. I introduced myself to her and I can still see her looking up at me. Jane was only five feet tall, everybody. I can still see her looking up at me with a pair of large brown eyes that made me start shaking. Excuse me. <clears throat> she had a little smile of welcome for me and to say that I thought she was grand was putting it mildly. At any rate, she had never had a speaker there for her union, so I decided to stay and do what I could help. We held meetings on the street every night, had wonderful crowds. We carried on the work of organization, possibly better than it was in any other part of the country. And then he says, Jane and I were continually, were together continually. We were both so wrapped up in the movement that we got a tremendous enjoyment out of it. You remember that slide from the Reds? when you saw the young Warren Beatty and Diane Keaton. Well, just think of Jane and Charles Devlin. He was an idealist. He truly was. And he was for most of his life. And you can see the idealism right there wrapped up in the movement. And so Jane is becoming more into the IWW as a movement, even though she started that union under the guise of the IWW, and she really wants to punish these women on, Cap on um, Capitol Hill. She and Jane and Charles are together for a while, um, not as long as I thought they were when I actually got into it. And he, he does father two children. She does not marry him. She's not going to get married again. She's already been burned from that. That is not going to happen. And then we have this fellow. Here's another one. The other man in her life, besides Jack Street and then Charles Devlin. This is Calanil Sellers. He was a con man. He was a thief. He was a radical. He was an extreme radical. And he was infatuated with First Grace and then with Jane. He also sexually assaulted her. The Bureau of Investigation was watching him closely when World War I started because by then they're considering the Western... Uh, the Western, listen to me, 
the uh, IWW as radicals. They start being calling them Reds, even though they were formed long before there were Reds. One of the agents on October 23rd, 1920 is reading these letters that Callanel Sellers is writing to Jane. He, they start monitoring his mail and opening up Jane's mail. They say, his activities in Denver and Pueblo, Colorado and Butte, Montana, Mark hit him as one of the most intemperate advocates of violence and sabotage in the history of the IWW. The Sedition Act was passed in 1918 and the Sedition Act was a part of the Espionage Act because the country was suddenly afraid, of course, the robber barons, the, the corporate interests were afraid of the IWW shutting down the industry because so many of their people worked in mining um, working the wheat fields, harvesting the wheat fields, the lumber caps, camps, etc. And when the Sedition Act passed, basically, and I'm just paraphrasing this, it just said that any scurrilous material that defamed the military uh, and the United States flag or even the uniform uh, was considered uh, treason. That if you wrote anything against your government, that was treason. Um, and you can imagine, you know, today, can you imagine how many people be going to jail for treason? So you were not allowed to say anything negatively at all. And so that means any literature that you have that is criticizing the government, if you're caught with it, you would go to prison. And the prison terms are generally about 20 years and there was a hefty fine. If you were an immigrant, you were deported right away. So they're watching Callanel Sellers. He's easily identifiable. If you look at his hands, he had a hand broken and he's got these crooked fingers going everywhere. Uh, I think I wrote like a child's pile of pickup sticks. They're just going all different ways. He's trying to hide his hand there in this particular photo. And this agent comes back and he says that again, he appears to be the most deserving and favorably defendant for the initial prosecution, meaning rounding up all the IWWs for taking Jane severely to task for support for sub, sub, subordinating the interests of the revolution to the desires of sex and her children. What this man did is he put pressure on Jane Street that she had to choose between motherhood and the revolution. And Jane loved her children and she loved being a mother. So um, these are the men who have a big influence on Jane, almost all of the men. He told her, Colonel Sellers told her that it seems to me that if you had enough consideration that you could have avoided maternity this last time. That's her last pregnancy that she had with Charles Devlin. He's not happy about that. He reminds her that, she, that he had protested so earnestly against bringing her, her having the baby. She should have aborted it. But he's re, he was moved to refrain from it on account of her being a prospective mother. It was too late. He warned her, when that awful time comes, as come they will in this country, when we are forced to choose between the streets for a battleground, you will have to skulk in the real rear with your little ones. No, little one, you cannot bring lives into the world and stay with the revolution. You with your splendid abilities and magnificent re revolutionary ardor are lost to the revolution. That is to replace capitalism with economic socialism. And he wants Jane to disperse seditious reading material. Now I've jumped ahead. I've jumped ahead of events that happened in Denver. Things don't go well in Denver. Um, and Jane leaves in 1917, just as we have gotten into the war. World War I changes everything. She loses the union as a result of things that are that these attacks from these other IWW men and Big Bill Haywood, who was the current secretary treasurer. One of the things she does, though, that shows that she was not a 100% revolutionist is when World War I starts before she leaves, she decides they are, they are already talking about the draft and we have all these men who are leaving. And the Denver Post publishes the story. It says, a plan to substitute women, traffic cops, detectives, and patrol women in place of all Denver police who may join the colors either through volunteering or conscription has been evolved by Mrs. Jane Street, head of the local domestic workers union, who proposed to furnish the women to the city in the event of war vacancies in the local department. Not only will Mrs. Street furnish patrol women, but also be prepared to supply fire women, post office, conductors, motor women, Female workers in all trades, she announced this morning. 
She declares that war will drain the West of men and that women will be forced to fill up the depleted ranks of industry. So the little girl born in Indiana, raised in Arkansas, she's American and she hasn't had the experiences that the disenfranchised men who hoboed to California and West went after these panics, the men who could not find work and were treated so badly. She hasn't had those experiences. So she still has patriotism. I have a chapter entitled the book called The Virus of Patriotism. The IWW does not like this. And so again, she has all these forces against her when she ends back up in California. So Jane's conflict, I guess, between activist and revolutionist, possibly, was she had a passionate desire for motherhood. And uh, she wanted also approval from those that were in the revolution. She wanted to prove her character that had been so disparaged in the IWW, the, the Denver Domestic Union, IWW. They did her great harm. She is trying to repair that character. And in the end, she has these outside forces like Callanelle Sellers. So she gave in. He wanted her to hand out seditious material. He's being watched, therefore she's being watched. And uh, you'll have to see what happens as a result of all of that if you read the book, and I, I hope you will. So I wanna share this real quick. So this cartoon that actually was used to illustrate an article by Charles Devlin. It says, you are only a scrub woman and a servant. And you see the little maid down there. And of course, then you see the maid is standing up tall and she says, yes, but I am organized. Jane Street started something. It's still being addressed today. I don't know if you know this, but um, women who actually work for families on a permanent basis. They have no, very few rights. Uh, with all the laws that were passed for labor in the country, protecting people, things like workmen's compensa compensation, eight hour day, things like that, they were not given to the domestic workers. And so the Domestic Workers Alliance is still addressing this, um, these things and I, I thought it was really funny one of the ladies that was really a naysayer on Jane her name was Ellen Van Cleeks she was a Capitol Hill mistress who didn't like Jane one bit or what she stood for and she wanted her servants in their place and I in 2019 when I finally finished the book the women's march in Denver started right in front of where her Van Cleeks uh, mansion was I thought that was kind of a coincidence um, and so I'm going to end with this slide and it's one of my favorites. Jane later said, I organized women once. I saw them build something, but I love them enough to do it. Okay. And that's, I'm going to conclude right there. I don't know if there's going to be any questions or not. And I don't know how much time I have. Thank you so much, Jane. This history is so fascinating and complex. I know that there is so much that we could talk about. Um, if we do have um, any questions, we will take just a few moments. I didn't see any pop up during your talk, but I'm sure um, people are interested in learning more and um, you can do that definitely by purchasing the book. Um, we do have it at the Center for Colorado Women's History, so we encourage you to pick it up there. Um, and it looks like, um, let's see, we have some feedback um, that Deborah thought the talk was fantastic. So um, thank you, Jane. And um, so I don't see any other um, questions at the moment. Um, I will take this time to encourage um, everyone to join us for our next program, which will be on May 15th, Academic as Detective, with the author of Remembering Lucille, a Virginia family's um, rise from slavery and a legacy forged at a mile high. And that will be with Polly Burgos McLean talking about her process um, for research. And you can um, find the link for that in the chat. And we hope you'll join us then. Um, Jane, thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. And thank you all so much for joining us today.
You're welcome. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for having me.